All right. In, in terms of a quick protocol update, the uh, public test net is we're shooting for uh, potentially next week. There are currently three items uh, on the protocol team's list that they are tackling that are blockers to fully launching a public facing uh, test net. Some of them are newer. Some of them are uh, have been around for about a month that they're just now finishing up. Uh, the biggest one is the governance parameters. So they're adjusting the governance or making it so you can adjust the governance parameters, which is going to be important with a public test net because you might need to change something uh, and you need to have all those parameters there. So it's this module for governance parameters. And um, once that is complete, along with some more recent items, uh, we expect to be able to announce a regenesis and move forward with getting more participants on the test net. For kind of my deep dive, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go into just a few more uh, mechanisms that we've put together for a possible uh, Shannon tokenomics MVP and just kind of explain part of the research and what's going on. And we're going to very shortly be releasing a lot more information uh, that will help a lot more people actively get involved in the research process, in the uh, modeling process, and, and really in understanding Shannon as a whole. So be looking out for that. But at least for now, I wanted to go over some of the areas that we're uh, currently thinking about. Just to give a quick recap before I get into uh, this new information about tokenomics and past builders calls, I've done a uh, a couple deep dives into a couple different areas. And so ultimately, this is kind of uh, the state of where Morse is. You can see we're doing about you know 400 million relays a day. Uh, we burn one pocket, but we mint a lot of pocket. Uh, but that's to keep the staking APR you know around 9% for stakers. Uh, that is great for the staking ecosystem, but it creates a lot of challenges, which is why we have to have permission or why we have to have permissioned gateways. We can't have permissionless gateways uh, because with that kind of burn to mint ratio, uh, that means anyone could just start minting pocket on their own by only burning. So we can't have that, which is why self-dealing uh, is mitigated by having permission gateways and then having that controlled via PNF, who does legal contracts so that uh, if anyone were to engage in that, it would be bad for their business. And I explained the uh, what I call the tokenomics trilemma that we're kind of dealing with, uh, where you either can have permissionless gateways and staking a APR or address self-dealing. They all you you can't have all of them all simultaneously, at least with the current current thought process that is a part of Morse's tokenomics. So this is where Morse is today. Where yeah, we have a good staking APY, we have self or we address self-dealing, but you can't have permissionless gateways. So that's where we are. If we kind of switch it, where we have permissionless gateways and self-dealing, we can't have a good staking APR. Uh, or if we have permissionless gateways and a good staking APR, how do we deal with the self-dealing uh, within Pocket? So what we're shooting for is this middle ground, uh, a completely new way of thinking about tokenomics and looking at tokenomics so that we can achieve all of these simultaneously. And so in the past, uh, and you could actually look at different builder calls uh, and we're, I'm going to be putting together a resource uh, when I launch these tokenomics resources that will allow you to look back at other calls that I've done. But in past calls, we looked at the question of uh, how do we prevent a node from sending relays uh, to only their own nodes to mint extra pocket? Uh, and we talked about distributing those rewards evenly across all suppliers in a session. Now, this uh, this mechanism, this isn't necessarily new. This has actually been kind of part of sh the Shannon vision ever since the very beginning. This prevents someone from, hey, I'm going to send all the, I'm going to send relays only to my node and just mint pocket. Uh, by distributing it to all nodes in the session, they can't have that kind of targeted gaming, if you will. And then the other question we had to address what is, okay, well, if suppliers are getting paid evenly inside of a session, how do we make sure that suppliers are doing real work in each session? Because now, hey, you get paid if you're just a supplier. So what's to prevent people from spinning up a supplier that's not actually connected to a chain source, right? Uh, they can't actually serve any relays. So, you know, and then they don't have the infrastructure costs, but then they still get to be a part of the reward share. 
well, we can't have that. So uh, what I originally coined Q, uh, useful QoS, um, which we're, we're still working on all these names. No, don't consider any of these uh, namings permanent. But um, the idea is to use on-chain data from gateways to identify suppliers that are not useful and jail them. And I gave this little example down here where you have uh, three different sessions. And as you can see, node four is clearly not up to par with the other with the other nodes in those sessions. And so because of that, the network will automatically jail them because they essentially are algorithm uh, through an algorithm, they are not on par with whatever the parameters are to be considered a useful node. So in this case, this uh, node that is not actually performing in any meaningful manner gets jailed. So that's how we prevent bad nodes or at least completely useless nodes from being a part of the network. I mean, as you can see, gateways are still going to do QoS checks and you know favor certain types of nodes and things of that nature. And we're going to balance all that out as we go. Um, and we're going to have plenty of parameters so that all these things can be adjusted. But uh, at least the vision here is this gets rid of the ones that are objectively no good. So you have to be useful to a certain standard or in order to receive rewards from those sessions. So this is where then the new stuff comes in because uh, we still have another big question that we have to answer. So how do we prevent large suppliers from gaming small chains that they control? Because even if we have relays uh, or rewards are being distributed evenly to all these different nodes inside of a session, if a supplier has a lot of nodes in that session, what's to prevent them from uh, still boosting that chain in order to generate more rewards, right? And I gave an example here. So this is like a small chain session that is predominantly uh, run by you know a single supplier. And so uh, you know in any like given session in this case, you know more than half of the nodes in that session are from a supplier. And at least from what we've modeled out, uh, and actually Ramiro helped with some of this modeling, where even if it gets down to twenty percent. Uh, even if a supplier has only 20% of a session, they could still potentially self self deal by just you know adding some extra traffic to just mint some extra pocket. And so we obviously need to somehow prevent this. We've prevented the ability to send relays to a specific node, but now we have to kind of take one step out. And how do we prevent suppliers from uh, at least large suppliers? Uh, or independent suppliers that have a very particular niche from being able to self-deal. So uh, how we do this is by delaying the economic uh, effects that relays have on a chain, making fake boosting a long and expensive process. Forgive part of my grammar here, but the idea is by delaying and by making these kind of uh, uh, systems take more time and require more expenses, we can dramatically reduce the likelihood that this would ever happen. And let me explain what that would look like. So today, uh, relays can spike on a service ID, instantly generating increased rewards for nodes on a specific chain. On the right, I gave this, uh, you can see the amount of relays maybe happening on the chain, and, or sorry, on the left, you can see the relays happening on the chain. On the right, you can see the rewards uh, that are being generated. And so right now, how it is today, when you see that jump in relays, you also see that immediate jump in rewards. This has just been the nature of Pocket, where uh, there is where everything is just directly correlated to the amount of relays. However, what we can actually do is something a little different. By steadily increasing the rewards for a chain uh, that has increased traffic, traffic spikes have to be sustained to maintain an effect on the chain rewards. So what this means is once you see the relays on the left suddenly spike, the rewards on the right doesn't, uh, doesn't immediately spike with it. Instead, it starts progressively increasing to match the demand. So what that does here is that means that you actually have to send a lot of relays over a course of a period of time in order to generate some kind of profit. Because once you immediately start sending those relays, because you're not immediately getting the reward, it's going to cost you, right? And you have to sustain, let me go back to this, you have to sustain sending more relays 
to the chain uh, in order for you to actually start generating a profit. So what this looks like in, in like a real world scenario is if in the immediate uh, increase with how it is today, if uh, there's a fake boost of like 3x the amount of relays on a chain, right? Uh, and, and for this scenario, I specifically took uh, data from base testnet. Uh, so on base testnet, which is a smaller chain, if it suddenly had 3x the amount of rewards in a uh, non-delayed system like we have today, it would it could cost around three hundred and eleven dollars uh, a week to in in pocket, of course, um, in a permission. And again, sorry, this is in a permissionless gateway world, right? So this is anyone can just spin up a gateway and start burning pocket in order to get relays. So in this scenario, someone's just spun up a gateway. Uh, they're funding it with uh, basically one hundred and eleven dollars of pocket per week. Uh, and if there's an immediate increase in rewards, what you have is after one week, uh, they can start having a return just basically immediately. And that return is, uh, you know, after six weeks, they can make cool $600 on uh, just serving that one chain. Or it would cost them 600, sorry, it would cost them $666. Uh, but the profit that they would actually generate is $700. So not only does that, and this is profit on top of the cost. So they've already recovered all their expense costs, but then they would get the extra $700 on top of that. So it's a profit, right? Uh, that's how it would look if you have an immediate increase in rewards. However, if you go to a delayed increase, uh, and let's take this same environment. They 3x the amount of um, uh, relays on that chain, and then it generates, and it's because, and it costs one hundred and eleven dollars per month. You see, a return actually takes six weeks uh, because uh, rewards have to steadily increase in order to match the 3x amount of traffic, and so it would actually cost them six hundred and sixty-six dollars. And after six weeks, they all five weeks prior, they would have lost money, losing money, losing money, losing money, losing money until week six, where they finally have a profit. Now, for this kind of scenario to work, there's a lot of elements, there's a lot of risk here, because say suddenly one chain takes off and is now making 3x the amount of relays, the rest of the network would be able to calculate, oh, wow, this is where these rewards are now going. It, it's more profitable uh, because there's so much more relays on this network than there are nodes. This is going to become a profitable chain. And people can actually see the market effect and be able to predict the market effect of relays on a given chain. So what ends up happening is you could actually have a supplier going back to this. You could actually have supplier B go, oh, wow, it's actually it could be way more profitable to actually uh, put more nodes because of the increase. And as it's increasing, I want to put more nodes inside of that chain. So you could actually have it where supplier A is losing his percentage inside of a chain session. And as he loses percentage, he would, this attack actually means it would take him much longer to get to profitability. The profitability I'm showing here is if no one decides to enter this new chain. And instead, it boosts in three times the rewards, and the rest of the network doesn't even blink. They don't do anything, and uh, no one moves into that network, even though there's uh, insanely increased uh, relays happening on it. That's not going to be accurate. So it becomes a, a risky way of trying to boost your own rewards, because you have to take a loss for a certain period of time before you would suddenly be able to profit from it. Uh, and actually, in this kind of environment, the best thing you can do for any node runner would actually be to focus on balance instead of focusing on some kind of fake boosting, because uh, this has a lot of risk and you have to be able to predict exactly how the network's going to respond over a six week period uh, to then only see $64. I mean, we're, we're talking about such a small gain, <laughs> such a small gain for this. It just doesn't even make sense. And you have to be able to read the mind of the entire network. So this is the benefit of what I'm currently modeling out, where you have a delayed increase in rewards. Uh, so this will be um, make it so we can allow you know any chain 
to be permissionless. Any chain can be added to Pocket. And uh, in order for there to be any meaningful gaming, it takes a lot of time and the rest of the network could easily respond to it. Uh, the problem with today is, again, when we're in the immediate increase, is if someone were to just flash a bunch of relays, you know, hey, I'm just going to do this for a day and just let my uh, uh, nodes get more rewards before other people have a chance to move over. Uh, that's, you know, that's a very legitimate strategy. And, you know, there have been things like some, some issues with uh, levels of gaming in the past with this kind of like flash boosting uh, in order to generate a little more reward. So what this would do for the supplier ecosystem prevents chain prevents large providers from boosting chains they run. Uh, and those are supposed to be small chains. Uh, prevents small uh, providers of small chains from boosting the chains that they're currently on. Uh, it also creates a more stable rewards for all node runners because again, you know, when you have the variable rewards. You have uh, uh, you can see the rewards are going up and down, you know, as as traffic goes. However, the rewards here would actually be stable. It would, it would be more stable, I should say, uh, and it wouldn't be as subject to uh, to change. There would be uh, at least the mechanism that uh, we are looking at now. There uh, is way to where you would lose rewards if a chain is out of balance. But if a chain is in balance and, you know, really close to that balance, you would actually be able to sustain uh, network average rewards in a much more easy fashion. Uh, and so that's why really the whole focus of suppliers would actually become, especially large suppliers, would be to find that balance uh, because that's actually where the most rewards are. The possible drawbacks of this is relay spikes don't immediately translate into increased rewards. Yes, that is something that it would be great if there was a way to to make it move faster or to counter that. And we're obviously open for ideas, but uh, in order to prevent that kind of quick, immediate return on fake relays, we have to add time in there. So uh, that's one of the possible drawbacks to this. But the benefits of what we get from this, we get permissionless gateways. We still maintain permissionless uh, suppliers. Yeah, like it, and we get stable tokenomics across the board, which is just very important to be able to uh, explain to new people entering the pocket ecosystem. Uh, so there's a lot of really positive uh, benefits with the possible drawback of providers that basically move quickly to get on a chain because it's spiking suddenly. Uh, there wouldn't be that incentive uh, to move as quickly. Within with sustained traffic, they can obviously see where a chain's going, and they can, uh, and it gives the ecosystem time to move over if this is going to be sustained traffic. But immediate spikes uh, don't translate into immediate rewards. So, what about the future? Uh, how do we know that all these that all types of data will work with this tokenomics model? Again, this is we're, we're talking about very specific, like how do we allow small chains to operate within Pocket? How do we allow you know large or in, in, enable uh, uh, or prevent large providers from being able to you know control a small chain? This is all specific to blockchain RPC right now. Pocket ultimately can go into LLMs. It can go into other forms of data indexing. Sky's the limit. We're technically a completely open protocol. So then. The question is, won't there need to be different tokenomics models for different types of uh, data? And the fact is, yes, there will need to be different uh, ways that we interface uh, and have tokenomics work with different service IDs. So Shannon will have the ability to have a very robust tokenomic system through the tokenomics module. Now, this is a Cosmos SDK module. Um, and it will basically, uh, it defines rules like minting, burning, jailing, and things of that nature within Shannon. And the beauty of how we're uh, wanting to design this is it can actually house multiple economic models, each with completely different logic happening at the same time, and then apply them to different service IDs. So... Let me let me just go ahead and, and uh, jump to this. This is how it could potentially apply. These tokenomics models would apply, and we're talk we're calling them uh, token logic models uh, modules. So a TLM. 
So a TLM has specific logic for us uh, that can be applied to different service IDs. So Mint and Burn is the uh, uh, is the one that we've talked about the most with Tannen. You know, one pocket equals uh, one pocket burned equals one pocket minted. Perfect. It's a super clean system, and uh, you know that that that's what we want. However, it doesn't account for many of the other things, and so we can actually stack other TLMs on top of that one, and then apply it to different different types of data. So, like specific for blockchain RPC, we can have a champion boost, which and we can have a supplier boost. All these can kind of work together in order to make the system that I've been kind of talking about for the past uh, few builders calls. But what about AI? Like everything I've talked about doesn't really apply to AI in any of the same ways. Well, what if we want to have, you know, we still want to have a champion boost so that the uh, those uh, the people that are building those AIs are still getting a boost of rewards for bringing their, uh, their data source to Pocket. But what if they're actual tokenomics should be determined by compute units, right? We can actually have a compute units module that uh, TLM that is able to calculate compute units and then calculate cost and then correlate that with minting and burning and uh, and jailing and all that stuff. Uh, we could also take some blockchain RPCs and actually choose to apply them to the uh, compute token TLM. And the great thing here is we could actually have blockchain RPC that users could actually pick and choose which one they want to use. Do they want to go through the compute token TLM or do they want to go through the uh, kind of more traditional one cost per relay or do they want to go with the or the compute token model? They could go either way. Uh, we could actually enable any data source on Pocket to actually have many different options that users could uh, choose from. And then in the future, we've got all sorts, like what other future services are going to be hosted on, date, on uh, Pocket? We don't entirely know, which means we can have future TL, TLMs that are able to meet those markets with where they're at. And so these uh, TLMs, uh, basically, they allows there to be these kind of like multiple sub modules inside the uh, tokenomics module itself that is built with the Cosmos SDK. And then kind of the goals is to allow new tokenomics model uh, models to be introduced to the network on a service ID level instead of on a, on a global level. So one model doesn't apply to everything. We can assign, uh, we can then assign specific token token models, TLMs, to specific service IDs, um, which would allow us to have all sorts of different data types. Anyways, uh, that's kind of the recap of where we're at with uh, with research. Um, in terms of kind of the full features, you can see the full features here of what is being put into this uh, tokenomics research. We're going to be, I'm going to be releasing a lot more of this very shortly. Uh, it's just every every time I, I think I'm close to releasing, you know, we we realize that there's something else that needs to be taken account for. So then I have to go back and, you know, make sure that it's accounted for. But we're going to be releasing all of this. All of this will be completely vettable by the community. Uh, we're going to have open discussions about each of these features, each of these abilities, uh, talking about the pros and cons, figure out what is worth having, what needs to be tweaked. Uh, there's going to be all sorts of conversations that we're going to be able to have over tokenomics. Um, so far, at least what I've shared today, the MVP model that I'm working with right now, uh, it's been currently reviewed by PNF, the protocol team. Oh, and then actually, it's supposed to say Pocket Scan. Uh, they, they've uh, uh, Ramiro has been great with reviewing a lot of this work and uh, providing feedback. So uh, a lot of people are uh, involved in kind of this discussion, but then it's needs to go to the whole community and open up to the community. So these are the features that are going to be available, and we're going to start talking about them once uh, everything is fully buttoned up and able to share. Because I, I just don't want to share something too early where there's just the conversation goes into uh, areas that weren't well uh, thought out. So I want to at least cover all the major areas so that we can actually have really productive conversations as a community and not get uh, hung up on uh, kind of rabbit trails. So. That's why a lot of work is going into this. Cool. Uh, that's it then. Uh, happy to answer questions. I was kind of confused with that table because if you pay what is being minted, it's, I know, it's like the free market. 
So I, I'm not sure why it's, it won't work for other types of AI inference or anything else. Well, mint and burn in this context with like blockchain RPC is, you know, not involving any other computing other than uh, a cost per relay. With AI, there might need to be certain uh, uh, where we charge on something other than a one relay equals this much pocket. Uh, most RPC providers, or at least a lot of them, uh, including Alchemy, who kind of coined this compute units uh, in terms of how they charge, you know, they there's different requests that have different levels of uh, compute units, which is determined, which then determines how much each cost or each call costs. So in a world where if we want to have AI inferencing, where every single request, regardless of how big or how small, costs the same across the board, then yeah, we could absolutely have just a mint and burn. If we're using any other kind of uh, calculating, or if we want to go into a, a system of compute units, then <coughs> that will obviously, uh, that could obviously look different. Uh, with that as well, if say we wanted to uh, incentivize more people to come uh, to bring, like say there's not a lot of traffic for LLMs at the beginning, but we want to create a, a boost for LLMs uh, so that even though there's lower relays, uh, they could actually get a boost in rewards. We can allow that. Uh, we could create a, a TLM similar to what we're doing with blockchain RPC, but you know it could be literally a uh, LLM boost, right? And it has certain rules. Uh, and it's governed by certain parameters, right? So kind of the, the vision of this is you can have all these different types of data types. We don't need to apply one system to all markets. We can be flexible and apply different systems to different markets, depending on their need, depending on how much uh, we want to reward a certain data type that maybe is being introduced in the pocket or what have you. Does that uh, answer answer question uh, efficiently? Uh, Zaytar, what are champion rewards? Champion rewards are something I talked about a few um, a few weeks ago. Uh, basically, it allows the data sources themselves to uh, get a share in the rewards minted. Uh, so let's let's take for example uh, Avalanche. The Avalanche uh, client, you know, those developers they're creating the software that the suppliers are running. So a champion boost uh, actually provides them a part of the rewards. Uh, from the relays that are happening through Avalanche. So this would allow Pocket to directly provide revenue for chain clients uh, or LLMs or any of that, because if that data source is on Pocket, the owner of that data source, whoever's championing the development of that data source, gets uh, a share of the rewards. 